So we're talking about the 1500s, the beginnings of the Reformation, and one of the problems that had happened throughout that, we talked about when the Roman Catholic Church had control over pretty much all religious life in Western Europe, right? There's that old expression, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? Have you heard this before? Yes. So it's not too surprising to us to learn that the Catholic Church was kind of abusing its power, okay? And there were two big ways that sort of a lot of people could look and see that is an abuse of the church power. And one was political. So a lot of Europeans felt like it just was not really cool for the church to use its spiritual power to create political power. And it was very clear to many, many people that that's exactly what they were doing. So for instance, in what is now Italy, there was, right across the middle surrounding Rome, was the Papal States. This was a country, and the Pope was the king. Right, so he was not only the spiritual leader of all of Roman Catholics, but he was the king of his own country. And what happens with kings of countries with neighboring countries? They get into wars. So the Pope was going to war with his neighbor, as kings often did, over political problems. You stepped over my river or whatever. And that creates this very strange thing, especially for his neighbors. Okay, I'm the king. And I'm going to war against that guy because he was rude to me, but wait, he's the Pope, and he can say, send, basically send me to hell for all eternity because I'm going to war with him. Uh, I'm very confused about this, right? Do you see how that's like a weird abuse of that power? And the Pope would go into Germany and say, you need to do this, and you need to do this. He's making political demands and sort of holding it over all of these kings is, I'm going to send you to hell if you don't do what I say you need to do. Even though what his demands were were very much like, pay taxes, go to war against that guy, very, uh, what's the word, earthly things, right? Not your eternal soul, not the kinds of things we think about. Okay, in religion, your holiness, I get it, you're the boss. Politics, why do you stay out of it? So this was a big, big problem. And the further you got from Rome, the more upset about it the kings were. So as you go, increase your distance from the center of power, you sort of feel that power less. So when the Pope comes up and says, no, you have to do this, people are like, no, <laughs> nine, <laughs> I don't want to do that. Right? You, you're way down there in Rome. Right, so your old lower school teacher comes up and tells you to do something. You're like, wait, you can't assign me homework anymore, right? You're very far away from me now. I don't, this is not necessary. Then the other big one. Was this idea of the indulgence. I will quote my 8th grade medieval history teacher, Mrs. Kilroy. This is what she called these. Get out of hell free cards. Like in Monopoly, the get out of jail free card. This is not entirely accurate, but it's a memorable line. She said that to me in 1987, so I've remembered it for that long. Okay, so the get out of hell free card. All you have to do is, uh, they started out okay. It all it said, okay, here's what you do. You go help three little old ladies cross the street and get them to come and talk to the priest, and the priest will give you this piece of paper. It's called an indulgence, and it says that 
A couple of your sins have been washed away. So your time spent in hell or purgatory is, uh, is reduced by a little bit. Purgatory is like the waiting room before you either get into heaven or hell. Anybody, is, is anybody Catholic? They don't do purgatory anymore, I don't think. I think they have got rid of purgatory recently. Um, but purgatory really was the place your soul went after you died, and it waited there for a long, long, long time, and then got into either heaven or hell based on what you had done in your life. And they would say, okay, we can cut down the time your soul spends in purgatory before it gets into heaven, or we can like work on the fact that you're going to hell, we can forgive some sins, you know, that time you murdered that guy. Um, you're going to have to help 95 little old ladies across the street. Those are called good works. So if you did some good works, then you could be uh, indulged to get out of some time. <coughs> so that might have been okay. You had to do something, Gesundheit, you had to do something to get the indulgence. Then they shifted, and it went to just... You pay them, and they give you the indulgence. There is no prayer involved, there is no good deeds involved, there is nothing but paying the church, and you get your time in hell reduced. Good deal, huh? So, that really upset some people, not everybody, because there were a lot of people who bought them and were pretty psyched about it. Right? This is great. That time I killed the guy, I can just pay them, you know, $8,000 and I'll, I'll get the indulgences worth the, the murder of somebody. Woohoo! Right? But you can see how that's an abuse of that power. So, here we come to October of 1517. This guy, Johann Tetzel, was a Europe-wide famous seller of indulgences. And Johann Tetzel comes to Wittenberg, Germany. So Tetzel comes to Wittenberg. To sell indulgences. And really what he's doing is they're going to build a new church in Rome, in Vatican City. And they need to raise money for it. And so, instead of holding, like, bake sales and whatnot, they sell indulgences, and the money from those indulgences is going specifically to build a new cathedral in the Vatican City. And there's a local uh, monk priest in Wittenberg whose name is Martin Luther. And he feels very strongly that this is really bad. He feels like, if you want to raise money for a church, tell us that you're raising money for a church and take our money. That's fine. But don't tell us that you're releasing souls from purgatory, because that's obviously ridiculous. There's nothing in the Bible about it saying that the Pope can cut your sins off. If you... It just doesn't make any sense. So, Martin Luther protests this guy, Tetzel. Sorry, that was not good handwriting. Martin Luther protests him with that document, the 95 Theses. And this is 95 statements about ways that the Catholic Church should rethink the way it does business. Um, the book says he may have tacked it to the church door. That's pretty accurate. Um, the main church door in the town usually was like, like a poster board, like a kiosk where people would post everything. So he tacked it on the, on the door. And... People did this sort of thing sometimes, not all the time, but his 95 theses were pretty well written and very well argued. 
and they started to get people's attention. And Wittenberg is up in northern Germany, so it's far from Rome. It's far from that control center. So the local prince of Wittenberg is sort of like, oh, hey, that's, you know, there's some good ideas there. Rome is kind of misbehaving. Maybe I won't listen to them either. And other, other priests around that area look at these and say, you know, that Martin Luther, he's got a good point. He has like 94 of the 95. Those are good ideas. Right? So let's start listening to what he has to say. And basically, the, the time and the place was exactly right to create this movement of reforming the Catholic Church. We want to we wanna protest what they're doing, and we want to reform it. So we get two words coming out of that that you have heard before in this class. Reformation, reform, and protest, Protestant. Right? So that this is the beginning of that idea. When he checks these things up, that is when the Reformation really starts. Um, and fit, so very quickly, um, well, it was four years later, which is pretty quick for the time. Martin Luther is talking, is talking, is talking. The other thing about this is that Martin Luther was kind of a bulldog character. He was loud, he was obnoxious, he swore a lot, he, uh, he would not back down from a fight ever. He, he, when, when he, the bulldog characteristic of he grabbed something, he would not let go. There was no way he was going to give up on this just because somebody tells him to stop. And in fact, them telling him to be quiet does what? Makes him louder. Right? He was that kind of a guy. The quote here in the book is exactly right. I am rough, boisterous, stormy, and altogether warlike. Yeah. He's writing things, calling the Pope the Antichrist, and pack of dogs, and all this stuff. I mean, he's, he was very, uh, very serious in his, in his language to them. So, let's see, when was the, it was 1521? The diet of worms is not a way to get skinny. It is a meeting in the city of Worms. Germany, worms. The German word for worm has a U here instead of an O, so it's a different, it's a totally different word. Not worms, it's worms. So. And at the Diet of Worms, they called Martin Luther in, they said, we just want to chat about your stuff that you've said, can we have a talk? Martin Luther goes, and they say, take back everything you've said, Get rid of your writings. Tell everybody that you were wrong. And given Martin Luther's personality, you can guess that he basically said, no. The famous quote from him at this point was, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. I can't change my beliefs in the truth of what I've said. I won't do it. So the church asks him to recant. Church... Recant means take back. He says no. And that was really it. That was the end of the relationship between Martin Luther and the Catholic Church. This man who had been a monk and a priest is kicked out of the Catholic Church officially by the Pope. He is excommunicated. Uh, he gets married, right, which wasn't okay for priests, still isn't okay for priests. Um, and he leads a new church. So he basically creates the church of Lutheranism, though he didn't call it that. Uh, this was the church of the Protestants. These are the people protesting against uh, the Catholic Church. So when we go back up here to our family tree of all the different churches, 
right? The first one, really, was this one here. It was Martin Luther's church that was the first Protestant church. Make sense to everybody? You can just murmur yes or no. You don't have to be ready. Okay, good. So, quickly, the ideas, basic ideas of Lutheranism as different from Catholicism. If you look, if you've got your book, you can look on page 64, and it shows you some of the basic, uh, the basic beliefs of Lutheranism. Oops. <laughs> going to work for me. The, there's two, two, I think, of the most important differences, the one that I just want to highlight the most. This sort of, that, that page breaks it down. You have a nice graph you can compare and contrast. But this was probably the biggest difference between Luther and the Catholics. <laughs> Man is saved by faith alone. Through faith alone shall man be saved. I forget what the exact quote is uh, from, what's his name? Jesus. Uh, but Jesus says something very, very close to this. And Martin Luther says, what does that mean when Jesus says that? What does that mean, for real? It's a very clear statement by Jesus. It's not symbolic, it's not anything else. So, Martin Luther thinks a lot, and basically what he says is, it means that all the ceremonies, all the different things that, that the Catholic Church has instituted, all these steps you have to do, you have to go to confession, you have to do all these other things, those don't really mean anything. The good works that they ask you to do, the helping of little old ladies, the, the whatever it was, the charity you had to give, the giving 10% of your income to the church every year. All you have to do to be saved as a Christian is believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior. That's it. Easy. And... The Catholic Church, obviously, is not going to be a fan of this idea, because it means that everyone who believes this can just abandon the whole structure of the Catholic Church. They stop giving money, they stop paying attention to the priests, right? There's no rules for them to follow, all they have to do is believe that Jesus is the Savior. And they are a Christian, and at least have the potential to be brought to heaven after they die. Live eternally in in absolute paradise through one simple act. So you can you can understand why the Catholic Church might be really, really scared of this idea and really not like it at all. Because it basically trashes their entire system. Right? People don't tend to like things that trash their entire system. And the next thing is for Martin Luther I will change that Bible. I will put a capital T on truth. That the Bible was the final source of truth. It was the beginning and the end of where the truth was. And the problem that he had with the Catholic Church is that they had added to the truth the church teaching. So the Catholic Church had a long time to develop a whole bunch of traditions. They have a power structure. It's sort of army-like. You've got Pope. You've got Cardinals. You've got Bishops. You've got Priests. You've got Clerics. You've got monks over here on the side and nuns on the other side. Keep them far apart. Right? Um, 
And they had all these other things, these ceremonies that you had to do at certain times of day and certain times of year, and all of these traditions. And they taught that if you don't follow that tradition that we made up at some point, your soul is in trouble. And Martin Luther said, wait, can you show me in the Bible where it says that you have to do that? And they said, no, it's not in the Bible, we made it up, but it's still really important. And he said, no, 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 get rid of that. The Bible is where it's at. It doesn't have anything to do with anything that was made by man. If it's in the Bible, it was made by who? Jesus. Made by Jesus or by God? The Bible is the word of God as put through the pens of man. The people who wrote it were inspired by God to write the actual truth about the world and the universe and God and spirits and all that stuff. And he does not have any patience for crazy interpretations of that. He's like, nope, it says what it says and that's what you did. And the and so what he what does he want to do? He wants to give everybody access to the truth. He says it's stupid that the only priest can read the Latin Bible. Everybody should be able to read it. Alex should read it. Everybody should read it. I should read it. I get it, and he translates it into German so that Germans can read it. And actually, his German Bible becomes the foundation of modern German language. It's that important. Everybody reads it. And this is a big, big difference with the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church, I think it's in your little graph there, it says that the truth is the Bible and the church teachings. And Martin Luther says, no, it's just the Bible. And if you have a church teaching that you spun off somewhere along the line that's vaguely related to the Bible, then it's still not okay. Do what it says here. 